So today, uh, our brief agenda is, for those of you who are not familiar with Alinex, I'm going to go through just a, just a quick introduction of who Alinex is and how we help and partner with our customers. From there, we're going to go into a little bit of a design uh, automation overview, kind of reviewing a little bit of the history, the benefits, process, uh, some of the different solutions that are available to you today. Um, and we're also going to review some real-life customer examples uh, just to give you some food for thought for some of your own projects internally in your company. And then finally, we're going to wrap up with a short um, overview, technical presentation from Cole. So to get started, Alinex, uh, we have several offices uh, throughout the country. Uh, Cole and I happen to be in our Minneapolis uh, headquarters today. Really what we do at Alinex is we help companies improve their technology process and people to help them be more competitive locally, nationally, and globally. We do that with a variety of different technology solutions. Uh, many of you on our webinar today already have SolidWorks, but as we do, what we like to do as, at Alinex is help uh, increase productivity throughout the entire enterprise. Today, what you folks are looking at is just one of those solutions for design automation and sales configuration, but we also get into the manufacturing side of things, uh, custom programming, quality, uh, CAM, simulation, and data management. So to kick off our engineering and sales automation, I want to talk about a little bit on this slide. I'm not going to read through every one of these, but these are the, th as we work with our customers on a daily basis, we often hear these items, these bullet points that you see on the screen here today. You know, whether it be uh, our engineering's a bottleneck and it's taking a long time for engineering to to redo a design to get it out the door to manufacturing, to uh, our coding process. It's taken us a while to respond to our customer inquiries, and sometimes we don't actually respond to all of them just because of the time and overhead it takes to get something out the door. Um, we also hear that we've got uh, a lot of our, our company IP or, or intellectual property and the way we do, do things in our company is tied to maybe long-time employees who have been at the company for a long time. So Bob, who's been with the company for 20 years, when everybody, some, somebody has a question on something, they just go ask Bob, whereas our, our customers are now trying to tie that company IP and intellectual property into a system that the entire organization can benefit from. So you may, you may or may not have some of these in your own company that, that are important to you, and we're going to kind of review some of these today. So when we talk about design automation, there's a lot of buzzwords out there regarding design automation. You know, also known as knowledge-based engineering, rules-based engineering, design to order, configure to order. So there's a lot of different names uh, that our customers and the, and the industry goes by. But really, we're talking about the same thing here today. So a little bit of a history. For a lot of you out there who may have uh, start, you know, been in the industry for a while, you may have started off on the board. I know myself and Cole, we used to do some drafting on the board. And when we start talking about automation and, and design automation back then, anybody who's been around for a while may remember Mylar drawings and, and a, something, a process called 2080. And really what that was was a Xerox machine called Xerox 2080. And if you wanted to do automation back then, what you had to do is hopefully maybe before lunch, go to a Repographics room, order a bunch of prints that were hopefully uh, done a couple hours later. And if we were changing the size of a conveyor or something from 7 feet to 12 feet, what we ended up doing was going out and getting some white out, whiting out the dimension, changing it from 7 feet to 12 feet, and rerunning through the machine. Now that was our new print. <laughs> so you can imagine that, that that automation isn't really there. And it's, timely and slow. Uh, today there's also a lot of customers or a lot of people out there who are using 2D CAD. And you know 2D CAD, the automation that's with 2D, uh, typically if is uh, industry specific tools such as auto list programming if you're an AutoCAD user to Visual Basic. But really what we're doing when it comes to automation there is we're still automating dumb entities, arcs, lines. Um, so it's, it's really, we don't get any of the benefits of, of 3D and being able to check fit, form function, analysis, things like that. Uh, also what ends up happening oftentimes in this case is that your tools are often 
held hostage. And what I mean by that is we, we often hear when we talk to customers who have done a lot of customization is they can't, they can't upgrade their, their CAD tool or their ERP tool because they're all tied together. If they upgrade one, it's going to break the other. So, again, it's, it's, a, it's a more rigid solution, and, and it's, a, it's a very old technology. Another way of doing things is even if you are using 3D CAD, before there were tools like, like DriveWorks and, and TactonWorks, uh, our customers were doing custom programming, so either doing C++ or Visual Basic to, to go into an interface with, uh, with the 3D CAD Tools API application programming interface. Now, this is still faster in 2D. We do get some benefits, but still, we're in, you know, it requires a programmer to go in and do this. Your systems are still held hostage, um, and oftentimes what ends up happening is the case is now, more recently here, we've had a couple of different customers come back to us and have our programming team help with updating some of their, their scripts and programs to work with the latest version of SOURCE because the person that they had internally do that has left the company, so now they, they really don't have anybody to do this, so they're, not, they're dependent upon others. For you SOLIDWORKS users out there, you probably know that, that we can do some type of automation with SOLIDWORKS in Excel. Now, this is... Uh, this is fairly inexpensive. Every SOLIDWORKS user out there probably has Excel on their machine already, but, uh, we're not, but it's not a complete tool. Oftentimes our customers are trying to also generate additional documents such as Excel forms or Microsoft Word template or quote, other items that go along with it. So even, we, even though we can do some type of uh, automation with, with Excel, we're, we're pretty much limited to just SOLIDWORKS documents. Okay, so, well, so it's limited, but it's you know it's it's crudely effective in, in, in what we can do. Now today there are there are off the off the shelf or out of the box type solutions that can help with this, and the benefit of these tools, and what I'm referring to is DriveWorks and Tacton, is they don't require any custom programming. What we do is the the person who can who's going to set up the rules, which you're going to see later today by Cole can uh, set up uh, input sheets uh, from there, uh, turn them into a rules engine, and, and specify what we want those output or deliverables to be, whether it be additional CAD models, drawings, uh, build material, cut lists, quotes. So all these items can automatically be generated now today, and we're going to see that in just a little bit. So again, the benefits are being able to capture that design knowledge. Uh, so, you know, you know, engineers, designers are not cheap, and instead of paying engineers, designers to make products longer, taller, wider, um, why not put that information to a system that, that other people in the company can now leverage and let the designers and engineers focus on being more innovative and, and producing better products for the company. In turn, you, you folks can be better than your competition. Uh, we can save time by automating repetitive tasks, hopefully respond to customer inquiries faster, and hopefully make uh, you know make our customers more productive, more profitable in, in the long run. You know, as with anything we do at Alliance, we have a tagline, and that is, we understand, we apply, we deliver. So I just want to take a few minutes, just like every project that we do at Alliance, our design automation solutions are no different. We go through a methodology when it comes to implementing a, a solution like this. We understand. We first. Uh, you know, we often meet with our customers and go through several discovery meetings because we want to understand what your goals are. Okay, so we'll listen. We'll listen. You'll tell us maybe not necessarily your goals for the immediate future, but also three, four years down the road. Once we've heard what you said, we'll mutually work on a plan together that that uh, you know we actually control it just like a, an engineering document. So if there is a change, we 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 make a a change notice and we re revision the plan, but we agree on a plan here and then we finally we execute on that plan. So when systems are in place, there's acceptance criteria that's, that's uh, measured inside of, this, uh, in, inside of this plan and as uh, we move forward, there could also be a phase two or phase three and we rotate and repeat this process. But the, it all comes down to expectations and no surprises. We want to make sure everybody's in the loop 
at all times. The next few slides here are, are just to get you, get you folks thinking about your internal process. Oftentimes we hear that, well, I can't, I can't automate my entire product design. Well, design automation is, the benefit of design automation is you don't have to automate your entire product design. Let's say 50% say 50 of your design now takes up four days, and we can get that 50% down to a couple hours. That's still a real business benefit for you. So you know, design automation applies across our entire, across multiple industries, from covers and trailers to motors to conveyors, you know, different uh, home products for sheet metal design to uh, we have customers making tooling uh, and automating their tooling design. We got different uh, different blowers to enclosures to doors. Now the the homework that, and the challenge I have for you folks is when we're done here and in, in your next engineering meeting that you have, and and someone asks, you know, how can you increase some of the productivity or speed things up? I want you to think about some of the bottlenecks that you may have, and I encourage you to have a conversation with us to see if there's a way we can help you. Dump trucks refrigeration coolers, conveyor systems. So design automation applies itself and works very well across all these industries. Before we move on to the technical presentation here, uh, Cole in, in a nutshell is going to be reviewing some of the master files, the parameters and how to control those. He's going to re also review setting up some example forms and workflows and we're, he's gonna also going to show how we can generate some of these deliverables, these different types of documents. So with that said, thank you. My contact information is right there. Uh, feel free to contact uh, myself directly or your, uh, your account manager at Alinex. And thank you. All right. Hello, everybody. Um, we're going to focus in on some of the more technical items um, as compared to the overview that Mike um, just presented for us. And I'm going to start out with a, a simple product. If you look at this basic uh, gantry or overhead crane frame here, uh, we have a couple of legs and a basic beam across the top, but obviously you can get this in a lot of heights and a lot of widths. And also, you know, maybe when we get underneath a certain width, this particular angle isn't necessary anymore and we can remove that um, to show some of that basic functionality of how this works. So how this all works, and it's not a lot of smoke and mirrors, it's actually really basic. If you think about how a typical user, if you were going to make this a new size, what you would do is open up the files, do a file save as, and start editing dimensions. And that's essentially what the system is doing in the background. And we'll start off by showing a few different products here and some of the interfaces that you can build with them, the different documentation that can be produced, and those type of things. And then we'll, in the end, we'll finish up with putting together a basic project so you can see what goes into setting one of these up. So starting off with our mobile gantry, this is my master model. This was my original model that my dimensions and features were captured from. I'm going to go ahead and close that so that we can produce a new one. If we grab our mobile gantry project, and you can have a whole list of projects in your trees you can see that I have here. I'm going to open that up. We can have some picture feedback on that. Um, basic picture feedback in this one, just a real simple project. We're going to set up and say our project number, and this can be anything you want it to be. And then we're going to give it a customer name, Bob's Lifts, something like that. And then you could maybe have a drop-down list of the possible you know, draftsman that's running this project or who's quoting this project or running it. And once we step through, we can pick some different screens. We'll go to a 1,000 gram load a width, and then we can set an opening height. And you can see we've got different tools that we can build in to choose different values. So you can help limit the values that are being chosen to a range that's acceptable. And with that, we'll go ahead and finish this one out. And we can show this generating. And you'll see it make us a new set of models and drawings for this. The drawings are also captured in the background. You can see it getting shorter. And it's also eliminated that inner angle iron that I talked about compared to our master model. And here's our simple drawing and then a, maybe a single detail drawing. 
And then in the end, we get our resultant folder. Now pay attention to this particular project because as I show different projects, um, we're going to demonstrate as well that you can store files in different locations and different file structures so you can meet the needs that you need. Here we just have our drawing, our overall assembly, and a couple of part files with this particular project. Now let's take a look at another project. If we open up another existing project that we have. Let's step in and look at a hydraulic cylinder. Everybody's familiar with hydraulic cylinders. And with this one, the interface is going to have a little bit more complex feedback and some different things. Also notice there are some rules down here. And right now my next and previous buttons are grayed out and I at least cannot proceed until I've resolved these situations. That can help you prevent, you know, partial data being entered. So we'll go in and choose from our optional bore sizes that we have. You can see here we have to have a stroke value between 8 and 23 inches. So we'll put in a stroke value maybe of 12. And then we have preset rod diameters that we can choose from. Choose a rod diameter, our pressure. And based on our pressure, we get different cylinder types. You'll see that as we step up to 5,000, you can see we are giving feedback where now we have connecting rods or tie rods on the outside of the cylinder to help it support that pressure. If we step down to the 4,000, you can see we no longer have those. That's great feedback if you have a customer service person on the telephone speaking to a user. Um, they don't have to know a lot about the product. You can have a lot of picture feedback coming to them while they're specking out a product so that they can have all the engineering knowledge that even the most seasoned engineer has and sound, you know, extremely intelligent speaking to the customer. From there, in here we also have a quantity built into this project because we're going to build some quoting information into this particular one. We can also determine if we want a clevis or not. If I unchoose the clevis and I choose next, it's going to go right by to the screen to choose my customer. If I back back up and say, no, I want a clevis, Okay, now when I step forward, it's going to go, okay, which clevis do you want? And again, as I choose clevis options now, I can be giving dimensional feedback to my customer instantaneously without having to flip through a bunch of documentation, without having to have memorized this information. This can all be instant feedback right in your project to whoever's running through this back. Next we have, in this case, we're actually putting customer information as part of our project. So we can choose different customers. We can see we have a customer list here, where they're located, and that type of thing, who the contact is at that customer. And then we can proceed to our final screen, and we can see here we're getting the result in euros, and that's based on where our customer is from. If we scroll back up. Let me see if I can choose. There's a customer in the United States. Now I step forward, and my feedback is now in dollars and cents. So you can build in those quoting options as well to give feedback, the proper feedback to the customer based on the options you're choosing. And we've also got our tax built in and our discount could be based on customers so that we can give them their total price. Go ahead and generate these models as well. As we walk through and it finishes up, we'll see in the end that we get We've got a few more documents included with this project that we'll be able to show. Going through some detailed drawings on this one as well. The last project we had kind of simplified to a single detail drawing. As you watch these details, you'll see it's cycling through, repositioning views, moving them around so that the drawing has a nice even view, even based on different diameters and sizes and lengths. So we have control of that documentation as well. Now a couple of the things to key in on here, we can see that not only do we have our SOLIDWORKS models and drawings, we've generated an e-drawing of the hydraulic cylinder and we've generated a PDF. We'll take a look at that PDF and we can look at that information. And we can see we've got some different drawing views. We can see the entire sheet. And this is like a bill of material pick list overview drawing that possibly you're sending to the customer as an approval drawing that they can approve and send back to you. You've summarized what was chosen for options. You've given a basic 
parts list. Okay, so maybe if they need to reorder parts, those types of things. So you can generate that type of documentation as well, along with your detailed drawings that are for manufacturing. In this one, we have also noticed we have a correspondence folder now. We've generated some documents that are in a slightly different folder. We have a quote that we've generated. So you can see here we've got a breakdown of costs in details about our hydraulic cylinder. We also generated a BOM and a cover letter so we can put correspondence back to the customer. Okay, so we can even automatically email these to them. Maybe we want to send them the PDF and this covering letter automatically. We can do that as part of the process. We can send that out. And now we'll step into some of the things we want to show in that project. Of course, we got we have all of our SOLIDWORKS models, drawings, those types of things that you would expect as well. I'll even show we have some, you know, our detailed drawings, those things that you would expect that you would also need for manufacturing. So we're getting a lot of data in just a couple of minutes. I'm going to close out a couple of these, and I'm going to show one more product line to demonstrate a few more documents and breakdown that we can work with. Let's open a project up here. Here's a common product that we're probably all used to in our home, a cabinet. And with this one, we again have a quote number that we're going to put in. And we can add in contact information. And we're sending this to Mike. And the customer is Mike's Kitchens. And salesperson is myself. And here we're choosing the currency type, so we can do a drop down. I'll stick with the US dollar, something we're used to. And now we've set some default values. We can adjust these. And as we adjust these, pay attention to the value turning below here so that we can be talking with the customer and giving them constant feedback at what the options they're choosing are doing to their baseline cost. We have also have different door types, so we can flip through pictures again showing different feedback on to the user that's entering the information. Choose different material types, go to pine, different handle types, and as we do that, again, see the price updating right as we work, and then we get a basic breakdown again of the cupboard that we've chosen, our handle style, the cost breakdown of that, and we can finish out our cabinet and generate this style cabinet. Again, you'll see it work with the master model. There's the adjustment to the assembly and working with changing the material to the pine and the handles that we've chosen. And we'll cycle through detail prints and some assembly prints, sizing those and adjusting. Again, updating all of our detail prints, showing cutouts, notches, places for dowel pins. And now we have even a more detailed breakdown folder structure. So we can break out our documents, you know, our covering letter and our quote again. Um, our drawings are broke out. You can see we have a PDF and drawing for each piece in this particular product. And then our models are separated into their own folders. So we have great control of files and what files go where so that you can keep things organized. In here we're also controlling, if we grab, let's grab a door and just hide that. We can take a look inside, we're placing hinges and things like that. Um, on the back side, you've accounted for the fasteners we need to nail this. Okay, so we get our right fastener quantity. Maybe this is furniture that's assembled by the customer. So that's important to make sure that that quantity is correct every time with the this setup, that quantity will be correct every time and consistent. Again, because it's coming from a single master model. Now, working off the master model, the benefits of that are any changes you make to the master model are automatically uh, projected forward into any new updates. It gets you out of that routine of maybe when you're in a custom environment, 
when you go to make a new model set or data set for a new custom order that came in, you go back and you grab an old file set that is as close to um, the current order as possible to limit the amount of engineering time. It makes a lot of sense and it's very common practice in a, you know, in a custom one-off shop. The catch to that is a lot of times when you do one-off things, updates don't get added to older models that have already gone out. And we consistently get into a loop of bringing forward um, errors that we've already corrected and maybe we forget to correct it on this one and we reintroduce that error to the shop. Um, so that's how this can really help with quality is by working off of a single point, a single master model, any changes that are made are guaranteed to work forward. And once these models are out of here, Mike spoke about, you know, 50%, uh, you know, maybe 50% of your product, maybe 80%, maybe 90%. Um, the key thing to realize is once these models come out, they're just SolidWorks models. There's no link back to DriveWorks. They're just a standard model like you'd be used to working at. So you can come in here and add cuts to it. Maybe you've got a specific cut. This customer wants an opening on the end here to put a plug-in strip in, and that's not a common option that you offer. Or maybe a customer needs a hole for a cord to go through because they're going to put some undershelf lights through. You can just grab this model at the end, take that one minute, and add those holes to those parts and update those drawings manually to take care of those one-off options that maybe you weren't prepared for in the automation process. So it's great to look at the tool that way as well. So that's some of your options as you work through this. Now let's get into what does it take to put one of these together? That's a very common question. So we're going to start a new project from scratch. Okay, so let me step in here and I'll show you what we're going to work with. We have a door and all I have so far is I have a master model, a door part, and I have some images captured of that door showing different options. Okay, so starting with this very simple basic data set here and we're going to go in and we're going to start a new project. So we'll say create a new project and we're going to tell it where that project goes. So we'll put that in our folder. It defaults to the folder name. We can change that to anything we want. I'll call it door. And we'll finish this project out. And now we're going to open a model to make it part of the project. So we can step in. I'll grab that door model that I pointed out. And here's our door we're going to be working with. Now the options we're going to allow, we're going to allow a 30, 32, and 36 inch door. We're also going to give them the option of having these panel cutouts or not, and we also have the option for the knob cutout or not. Okay, so that's what we're going to be working towards as far as a project. So I'm going to capture this door into my project, and the first thing I need to do is capture a couple of dimensions. So I'll go into our feature, and now capturing dimensions, all it takes is I'm going to pick on the dimension I want to capture and give it a name. So we're going to control the width, so I want to capture that. And we're also going to control when the door changes sizes, we're going to control these panels and change their width so that they're proportionate to the door. So we'll grab those dimensions, come back around. Now the last couple of things that we want to capture are the features that control whether these panels are here or whether these knobs are here. And one benefit we have is we can capture a folder and control that folder. So I'm just going to grab the knob folder, which includes all of the features that are the cutout for the knob. I can control that feature. I could control each feature one at a time as well. I'm also going to grab the panel features and add those as part of our project. And that's all it takes to capture the information from the model into the project that you want to control. And now we're ready to step into our DriveWorks window and start creating our form. So we'll go into our form design. And the first thing we're going to add is a combo box that controls the widths that the user can choose. 
So we'll name that with. We'll drop it in. We have full control over these boxes. I'll keep mine basic, but if we look over here, we can control background color. Uh, we can edit our caption, our caption color, fonts, those types of things. You can make this as graphically pleasing as you choose. We're going to key in on choosing our items that we want to control or that we want to offer to the user. So I'm going to grab that and we'll jump in here and we're going to offer the widths we said of 30, 32, and 36. Grab those numbers and then we're going to add a checkbox okay, to determine whether we have a knob or not. So we'll grab our knob. Now I can come back. Maybe I want that to say something a little bit more than knob to the user that's looking at the, the project. So in the caption, I can change it into a question, knob desired. So if that helps you create the form that you want, but not have to have lengthy names of the field names, okay? So we have that. And then the last we're going to choose is if we have a flat door or a panel door. So we're going to do a door style option group and we'll define the options that are available there. Now these dialog boxes that I'm typing into this rule builder, if you watch as I'm typing the window turns red at a certain time and a green at a certain time. That's helping you so that you know if you have a successful value in here without having to go run a test. You can see it just flipped to green. It's also showing me my values and my results. Um, and it will give me my steps down, steps and drill down an area for comments about the rules so I can explain what this rule is for or about. Um, great for helping you document your project as you're building it. And these windows can also be set to read from a database table so you could get a list from there. Um, we can look at an Excel table, we can make simple tables, a lot of ways to draw information into here and we can also write out to different databases and Excel sheets and those things as well if that is necessary. A lot of ways to pass data using DriveWorks. We'll say OK to that and we have our basic options on our door. Now we also have the ability to create variables and variables allow us to build equations that we can reuse or a calculation that we need to make that we're going to use in multiple places or maybe we have static values that we want to hold so that if we ever make a simple adjustment to our model we don't have to come and adjust a bunch of equations, we can come and adjust that single value and the equations could reference that value. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to add a variable that's going to create some text for us and it's going to be the knob selection variable. So it determines whether that knob has been chosen and then it returns the proper text and this is going to help us drive the picture that we have later and it could also be used to drive a quote document or things like that. So what we're going to say is we're going to say if that knob value comes back as true, meaning it's checked, we're going to return a value of knob. Otherwise, we'll return a value of no knob. Okay, and again, you can see the green. We can see that my value for knob return is false. That means my result is no knob, so it's helping me understand my equation as I'm building it. Okay, it'll give us steps, it'll give us drill down, you can see the breakdown of the steps. This is great for troubleshooting when you're working on developing these. Lots of nice user functionality in the windows. The next couple of variables are just going to be static values. The first one is our panel center spacing, which is a setting for how much space there is between the two panels on the door and that's just a basic value of six and we have one more static value for our panel side offset and that is a value of three and now we're going to take advantage of these variables to build a variable to determine how wide our panels should be. So this is going to be our panel width calculation. In here we're going to start off and I'm going to use some basic parentheses just to break out my equation. Basic math rules apply. So we're going to take our door width return and then we're going to calculate based on that side offset var variable that we have. We need to multiply that by two to account for both sides of the door obviously. Take that plus our center spacing. 
and then we'll take both of those and we'll divide by two because we have two panels. So that's where we're taking advantage of those settings and this carries forward to more equations so that if that ever changed, I don't have to come and edit these equations. I just edit my static variable and it fixes it. The last thing we're going to build is a, a selection result or a text string to help us choose some picture feedback. Okay, so I'm going to add a variable called selection result. And we're going to do a simple text concatenation where we're going to choose the door style return. And some simple text here. And then that variable we just created for selection result. Okay, so what that's returning right now is flat door based on the options that we have chosen. Okay, and that's going to help drive some pictures that we're going to put on our form now. So I'm going to bounce back to form design momentarily. Oh, I've got something wrong here. I grabbed the wrong variable. Let me delete that. You can see it's giving me an error of circular here. What I need to choose is my knob selection. So there it is. Now it's going to say flat door, no knob. So you can see that you're getting feedback on rules without having to run the project just to find out you have an error. <clears throat> With that, we can say OK. And then we'll go back to our form design now. And I'm going to add a picture box just to show how nice and easy it is to give this user picture feedback. I'm just going to expand that out a little bit. And then if you remember, I showed you I had those images in that folder to begin with. So I'm just going to reference those images into this picture box. So we grab our images and our selection result variable that we just had. And then the file extension name. So we have that. And now you can see we have a flat door here. I can test my form. So I can say I want a knob. You can see the knob pop in there. You can see the pictures looking a little funny. Well, let's fix that. We can control how these pictures fit into the box. We can say stretch image so that if the pictures are a little bit different size, the tool will compensate for you so you don't have to be a, an art genius to make these pictures work. And now as we go into test and I choose different options, you can see, again, I'm getting that nice fi picture feedback that I had before in my other projects. Now we have one last final step here to set up. If you remember, we captured those model items at the beginning that we wanted to control. We're going to come in and derive those values now. Our width dimension is simply going to come off of our width value. So I just double click on that. You can see this is just a lot of clicking and picking. I don't have to be a programmer, don't need to know Visual Basic or C++, anything like that. Our two panel width dimensions, I can build the rule for those all at once. That's going to be based off that panel width variable that we built. So now that I've got two values controlled by one option. Our knob rule, we're going to do a simple if statement on that again. So we'll do an if and then our knob return. So what we've chosen there, that equals false. Then we're going to delete that feature from the model. Otherwise, we're going to unsuppress it so that it's part of the model. Okay, Do very similar rule with our panel features. This is going to be our door style return. And I can build these in any way I want. You can see I kind of start off with that. I can come back and put the if in front of it. Very flexible on letting me work in whatever order I want to put these together. And this time I'm going to return text. So if I've chosen flat door, we're going to delete the panel features. Otherwise, we'll unsuppress those features. Okay. Now with those simple rules, I'm ready to generate a door. Okay. So let's close out here. We'll close out of the master door model. And we're going to go generate a new door. We'll save the project. Let's say we want a knob desired but a flat door. And we'll go ahead and finish this project out. And we'll finish and generate that. There's my new door model. 
and we've got that all finished out. So you can see in just a few short minutes, I'm already generating a part model. It's eliminated the panel features over here, so I still have the door features. Now, if you wanted, you could use a rule of suppress, so you could leave those features there to support that condition where I talked about where maybe you want to come back and manually edit things. Maybe the regular project suppresses it, the user comes back, manually modifies that, that's fine. So you have the freedom to suppress things, delete things, control dimensions, a lot of freedom to control um, different items in the model, and building the interface is, is extremely simple as you've just seen. So with that, that ends uh, the technical presentation. Um, at this time, if you'd like to type some questions in and send those in, we'll take questions and respond to those. Okay, it looks like we have a question here. Um, the question is, do I have to know SolidWorks or have SolidWorks to be able to run the product configurations? So if I understand that correctly, uh, if you have a salesperson or, or someone who's maybe not a SolidWorks user, do they have to have SolidWorks and, and, or no SolidWorks to be able to, to generate models? So that's a good question. That's one that we get asked quite a bit. Um, the answer is no. And let me, maybe that's a good segue to talk about the different types of, uh, of users of this system and how scalable DriveWorks and Tacton is. So everything you saw Cole do today was done from what we call a DriveWorks admin license. And what that means is the, it's meant that the person who's creating and setting up the models will also be the person who's going to generate and uh, specify the models to have them automatically output. So it's more of an engineering automation. But DriveWorks, we're also able to scale this up throughout the enterprise. So in the scenario, if you had salespeople or customer service who want to go and specify existing product, uh, we have something called DriveWorks user. So what, what they would see then is the form that you saw Cole have up on the right-hand side, they would see that in their own window. And what they have the option to do then is, and the beauty of this is that they can only specify items that engineering has made rules for. So in this case, if, if the max door that we could do was 36 inches, the salesperson can't go in there and specify a door at, at 72 inches or whatnot. So the idea is that they use that separate uh, interface to be able to, to specify the models, hit submit, What's going on then is it's sending it over to what we call DriveWorks Autopilot, and Autopilot is just taking those, uh, the, that information, those, those inputs, and then generating the models. You can have that done automatically, or you can have somebody re review them first and then release them to be uh, generated automatically. Uh, finally, the last thing we can do too is we have a product called DriveWorks Live where we're able to take uh, and put these forms if you want on your own website. So you could allow people to come into your website and generate um, the inputs there and be able to send those off into uh, the autopilot. Okay. All right, taking a couple more questions here. All right, taking a couple more questions here. Um, one of the first ones comes in is, could this be used to generate drawings where customers can pick locations of windows and doors in an enclosed trailer? Um, absolutely, this could be used for that. Uh, as Mike was just spoken, speaking about the live interface, um, you can walk through um, and choose different options through a web browser, and that can actually um, generate a product and send it back to you. Um, and if you'd like to test that, there's a site out there, configuremyproduct.com. Um, if you go check that out, um, you can actually, there was a trailer project out there at one time. I believe it's still out there. Um, you can take a look at that and see how that works with a semi-trailer. Um, so absolutely, we control options on a trailer. Um, next question that came in is, uh, if there's a general number of how many man hours it would take to set up an initial database. Um, that's a really hard question to put a number on. Um, it varies greatly depending on your product line. Um, and, and what you want to achieve and where, what level you're taking it to. Uh, but definitely get in touch with us, and if we take a look at your product in general um, and understand what your goal is, we can give you an idea of what the hour and time frame would be. The next question is, will this work with a PDM vault? Um, this does have an integration with the enterprise PDM system. 
so we can automatically check models into the workflow and send them into a standard workflow. Um, the great benefit of that as well is if you have integrations with MRP or ERP systems with your PDM, um, we can leverage that. Um, of course, DriveWorks can speak directly to those systems as well, but also if you have the PDM in place, uh, we can take advantage of those options that have already been built into your PDM system. Another question we have is if a new part configuration is made and then the master model is updated, do those updates trickle down into the previously created part? Um, they do not automatically trickle back to the previously created part. Um, and that's built in because of the ability that we want to have to um, model, make changes to the model after the fact that it's completed. Now you can take advantage of the system does have functionality where we can go back and tell it to regenerate specific models. And what that would do is regenerate off of the master model and replace it. So there is a tool to ask it to do that, but it doesn't do it automatically just by the click of a button. And that's to protect the user and protect models that have been manually customized. Okay, it looks like we have another question here. Are there ways to introduce intermediate calculational modules in a decision tree of building a complex model assembly? Uh, so it looks like both logical and mathematical intermediate steps. So, well, that was a mouthful there. So if I understand correctly, uh, is, is there a way that we can have uh, a, a question be a, a calculation and in turn the next set of options would be dependent upon that, that answer? Um, I think there is a way to do that uh, to a point with, with DriveWorks. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, too, we actually have multiple products. So we have DriveWorks and we have another product called Tacton. So uh, again, what we do is we try to present the technology and understand your needs. And then after we have fully understood what your goals are, we can recommend a technology that's best for you. So I was, I'm going to say the answer is yes, there's a way we can do that the products kind of do it differently, so we want to review that. All right, another question coming in here is if this works the same for assemblies or complex assemblies, um, and absolutely it does work with assemblies the same way you saw here. You can capture parts in an assembly model and swap those parts in and out of the model. Um, we do have that ability. Uh, and you can take advantage of you know in different things. You can swap sub-assemblies in and out um, and change configurations of the assembly model. So we do have that full functionality. Um, does it work with Workgroup PDM? Uh, yes, we do have some basic functionality with Workpedia, Workgroup PDM. Uh, it may take a little bit of customization on our part, but we can, uh, we can make it work with Workgroup PDM as well if you would want it to automatically check in files upon completion. Um, can it reference our custom materials database in SOLIDWORKS? Absolutely it can. Um, you can drive the material of a part um, simply by driving a custom property that is named DW material. And then it references the folder and the material name. So if your materials are built into the solid standard materials area in SOLIDWORKS, we can um, take advantage of that. Um, Taking note, uh, one question about dangling dimensions and, and what happens with those. Um, what can happen is if you eliminate a feature that a dimension was referencing, that dimension can still show. Um, there is a tool. Um, some people prefer those stay on so that they can review the drawings and verify. Um, others prefer that they're turned off. Um, and there is an option to just ignore dangling dimensions and not show them. Um, so that's how we can hide those in, in those situations. Okay, is there any more questions? Okay, well, if there's additional uh, questions that come up later on, feel free to contact us and we'd be happy to answer and uh, meet with you to discuss any of your goals that you may have. 
that being said, I want to thank everybody for taking time out of your day to join us today with our webinar. And we look forward to working with you in the future. Have a great day, everyone.